In this video, we're looking at the big section all the way from the beginning of chapter 12 into the beginning of chapter 15 of Revelation. The sermon I preached on this section I called Patient Endurance. As we've been seeing all the way through this series in Revelation, it's the Old Testament that is the lens through which we need to read and understand the symbols and the images that we see in the book of Revelation. And the Old Testament is very important background in this section. To go through everything in this section in great detail will make this video far too long. So I'm just going to try and give the overall structure and some key pointers to help you. But before we go any further, if you haven't yet read the whole section, please just pause the video, take some time to read the whole of 12 verse 1 to 15 verse 4 and try and note to some of the key repetition, uh, mark down some areas where you have questions and I'm going to just try and show some of what I've seen in this big section. The reason that I called this patient endurance is because within the big section we've got this double chorus. Uh, this calls for patient endurance in the middle of chapter 13 and then we see that same chorus in the middle of chapter 14. A very similar chorus. 14 verse 12. This calls for patient endurance. Now in this section uh, we see as the section starts, John sees a great sign in heaven. Uh, he's giving, he's being given a heavenly perspective on what we've seen in the previous few chapters, all the way since chapter 6 to 11. It's been uh, an earthly perspective, seeing the unfolding chaos and suffering in the world around us. And in the previous section, as the trumpets of warning were blasting, we saw a call to continue in witness. And that context of the ongoing witness of God's church is important in this section too. Now just quickly the overall structure. In chapter 12, we see the big section where we are called to this patient endurance in our witness, knowing that the war is won. We can endure patiently in our witness about Jesus because the war has been won. In chapter 13, uh, we see the next call to patient endurance in our witness. Even though the battle continues. The war may be won, but the battle continues. And in that continuing battle, we need to patiently endure in our witness. And then in chapter 14, the structurally we get two pictures in chapter 14, which we'll look at a little bit later. It's a glorious picture and a ghastly picture. And then in between those pictures, we see these three angels uh, calling for an enduring gospel witness, knowing that the end is near. The reason I included chapter 15 in this big section is we see it starts here with another great sign in heaven and that's how this big section started in chapter 12 John saw a great sign in heaven and we see another sign and it's those uh, signs that that hold this big section together uh, we won't be dealing with the beginning of chapter 15 in detail here because it very much is um, a transition a hinge point taking us into the next section um, but structurally that does uh, help us see a big section here. Now this is a heavenly perspective and we'll see this repetition of heaven throughout this big section. Now another just useful thing to look out for that helps us with uh, the structure of this section. We see this great sign at the beginning of chapter 12 and then we are told a whole bunch of things that John saw. He said, I saw a beast and then he saw another beast. Chapter 14, I looked. It's the same Greek word. So those textual markers just help us again to see the structure. John is seeing and drawing our attention to some specific things. And then just looking at some characters, we see here uh, this woman 
clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars. Now, this is where the Old Testament uh, helps us. Uh, this is echoing back to a dream that Joseph had in Genesis 37, where he dreamed of him and his brothers pictured like stars. Now, Joseph and his brothers uh, become the 12 tribes of Israel. So this woman is a picture, symbol, symbolic of Israel, God's people. And we see that she is about to give birth. And we can just trace uh, this woman through the section. But God's people are in view, not only pictured as the woman, uh, who we see in chapter 12, but we'll see a few other ways in which God's people are spoken of in this bigger section. Uh, the rest of her offspring. But in the song, in between these pictures of the woman, uh, God's people are spoken of as the brothers and sisters. Uh, they are the ones who have triumphed by their testimony. And in the, the two key songs or two key repetitions that we see, they are called God's people. Let me see that again here. The people of God. In chapter 13 here, they're called God's holy people. And in chapter 14, they are pictured, as we saw in chapter 7, as the 144,000. And they are those who follow the Lamb. They've been purchased. They are the redeemed ones. They are the blessed ones who died in the Lord. They will rest. Their deeds will follow them. And then... Chapter 15, we see they are the victorious ones. So this woman uh, is a picture of God's holy people, his uh, triumphant ones. But in the picture in the beginning, we don't only have um, God's holy people. We've also got this enormous red dragon. who is also called the accuser of the brothers and sisters here. But we're told straight away who that ancient serpent is. He is the devil, Satan. And this ancient serpent language, again, Old Testament, Genesis 3, uh, 1 and 15, we see the devil in the garden there tempting God's people. He's been the enemy of God's people uh, from those earliest days. Uh, another Old Testament reference here to the child who we'll look at in a moment, uh, from Psalm 2, there's a direct quote. It's always worth looking out for direct Old Testament quotes. And then go read that whole psalm to give you a better understanding of what's going on here. Continue with tracking the dragon through this section. But the vital next character for us to look at is this child about to be born uh, to the woman. Uh, we're told here a male, a son, a male child who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. And who is this child? It's a picture of Jesus. And we see, although the dragon wants to devour this child straight away, just as was said after the fall, uh, God said that a seed of the woman would come who would crush the serpent's head. This male son is that serpent crusher. He is the Messiah. And because the Messiah wins, he hurls down the dragon. We see that the dragon is hurled down. This male child is the same lamb who we saw in chapter 5, who is central in this, this whole section. And in this section, he is one like a son of man, which is Daniel 7 language. It's uh, Revelation 1 language. We've already seen uh, Jesus spoken of as the son of man. But this isn't the son of man who we heard in chapter 1 saying, fear not. Now this is the son of man with a sharp sickle about to judge the world. So a very different picture 
to what we saw in chapter one of Revelation. Now, as I said, this whole big section is, is calling the church to patient endurance in our witness. And this first section is showing us that the war has been won. Uh, this verse is a key verse. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. So the war is won. This great serpent, the enormous red dragon, although he looks terrifying, he is easily defeated. And that's what chapter 12 is showing us. He is easily defeated. But we do see at the end of chapter 12 this dragon waging war against the rest of her offspring, which is making it clear that uh, life this side of eternity is going to be difficult. He's waging war against us. We're going to need to patiently endure in our witness, knowing that this war continues. But the ultimate war has been won by Jesus. And then chapter 13 is showing us the ongoing battle. And we see uh, these two beasts. So we see the beast coming out of the sea and the beast coming out of the earth. And these are symbolic of uh, evil world powers, the first beast, and false religion, the second beast. So if we just quickly highlight and see where this first beast is mentioned. So this first beast we see has uh, 10 horns, 7 heads, 10 crowns. Uh, horns in Revelation are symbolic of power and crowns are symbolic of rule. So this is a powerful ruler. And so this first beast is symbolic of powerful world rulers who are setting themselves up against God and his holy people, waging war against God and his holy people. And so this section is just telling us the battle continues. Although the war has been won, chapter 12, the battle continues and it's going to be hard for God's people. World powers are going to be waging war against God's people. And the second beast we see is symbolic of false religion. And we see that this is powerful false religion. He's calling down fire from heaven, which uh, should make us think of uh, Elijah with the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18. Uh, in, in that story, the prophets of Baal couldn't call down fire from heaven, but this false religion here is powerful, um, deluding many, we see. And so as this battle continues, although the war is won, as we are to patiently endure in our witness, uh, we know that World powers, uh, kings and authorities will be set up against God and his people. And false teaching, false religion will lead many astray. A quick note on this uh, much debated 666. We shouldn't be expecting people to be branded in some way or chip under their skin. This is symbolic language. And 666 is uh, showing. So 7 is the, the number of perfection. Uh, so six is short of six 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 is short of seven short of seven short of seven it's a picture of false religion always falling short so so far we've seen the war is won and we need to patiently endure in our witness knowing that the war is won chapter 13 shows us that the battle continues life is going to be hard governments and false religion are going to be set up against God's people but then chapter 14 uh, pulls things together and says, it gives us these uh, pictures. Uh, firstly, in these verses, we're given a glorious picture. But then in these verses, we're given a ghastly picture. Uh, this is the end of time, the glorious picture of the 144,000. So these are uh, symbolic of all of God's redeemed people. Go back and watch the video from chapter 7, uh, where we see them. Uh, all of God's people, and they are in heaven with the Lamb, rejoicing together, uh, singing the song of the redeemed. It is a glorious picture. But then we're given this ghastly picture of uh, the Son of Man with his sharp sickle harvesting the earth. And we see all these people being thrown into the wine press of God's wrath and their blood flowing for 1,600 stadia. 
that is 300 kilometers with blood flowing up to a horse's bridle. Now it's meant to be a gruesome picture, not a picture we're meant to take literally, but a picture we really need to take seriously. At the end of the age, when the Son of Man judges those who remain opposed to him, it is going to be a terrible, terrible judgment. But there is also a glorious eternity on offer for those who have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb, uh, the, the redeemed ones. And so in between this glorious and this ghastly picture, this call for enduring gospel witness comes. So the eternal gospel is to be proclaimed. It is a gospel that calls people to fear God and give him glory, and to worship him. It's a gospel that tells that Babylon, this world order, Babylon is typical of a society set up against God, and they're going to fall. And we don't want people to fall with Babylon. And it's a call to say that false worship uh, is absolutely deadly. And we see here... Um, false worship is very prevalent throughout our world, but we don't want people to worship the beast. Uh, we want people to worship God, worship him, fear God. And so in between this glorious and this ghastly picture, there is a call to preach the gospel, uh, tell the good news, warn of the terrible news of misplaced worship and warn of the judgment that's coming. And we are going to need patient endurance to remain faithful to this call, knowing that one day we will rest from our labors. But that will only be when this glorious reality becomes our reality forever, when Jesus returns or when we are taken home, when we die. But until then, we need to patiently endure in our gospel witness. There is work still for us to do. Patient endurance has been a key theme. You can go and trace it through um, from chapter 1 of Revelation. It's in the letters uh, to the churches. Uh, patient endurance is what we need. And we can endure because the war is won. We've seen the victorious Jesus in chapter 1. We see the victorious Jesus here in chapter 12. We've seen him in chapter 5. The war is won. But what we've seen from chapter 6 all the way through into this section is that the battle continues. There is suffering. Uh, the trumpets of warning are sounding. And in the midst of this, we need to patiently endure in our witness, knowing that there is an end coming. It is an end that is both glorious for those who have been redeemed, and it's ghastly for those who haven't been redeemed. And so we have an eternal gospel to proclaim. And we need to keep proclaiming that gospel until the day when Jesus returns. And so that is the overarching theme of this big section. Patient endurance and faithful testimony is what is needed in the midst of the ongoing spiritual battle, knowing that the ultimate war has won. And we need to be encouraging each other in this to keep going. There are a whole lot of Old Testament um, background that you can go and dig into. You could go and uh, look at uh, Joel chapter 3 uh, for some background, or Isaiah 63 for uh, background to this image of the wine press of God's wrath. There are echoes of Isaiah 34 uh, in the, the picture of judgment there. So the Old Testament really does frame so much of what we see in this section. Uh, this king on Mount Zion also takes us to uh, Psalm 2, which we saw uh, in chapter 12 already. Uh, Psalm 2 was quoted uh, of this male son who will rule with an iron rod. So Psalm 2 is important Old Testament context in this big section. Um, so as you keep reading through it, use the Old Testament as the lens through which you read this section. And remember that we have a gospel witness to endure in, knowing that the battle is won. The war is won, the battle continues, the end is coming. So let's keep going with this gospel witness we've been called to. Well, God bless as you dig in further.